Hello everyone, we're on a new unit today, and this unit is Unit 5, and it's on Argumentative Writing. And today we'll be covering Section 5.1, Introduction to Argumentative Writing. Again, I'm Samuel Chang, here for Joiner English. Um, so, for this unit we're going to have three sections. You'll see in a little while the other sections, but first of all, let's kind of um, get the idea of what Argumentative Writing is. Let me go to the next slide here. So, like I said, this is the argument unit. So where do you normally see arguments occur? Think about that for a second. Where, uh, what do you think of when you think of an argument? Well, an argument is, you know, either a heated discussion between two people, which is what it usually means in regular life, but it can also be, you know, something like, you know, just a mild disagreement. It's two people that have two different standpoints, they're arguing or they're discussing over whose standpoint is better, right? So you see arguments everywhere. From every day at school to at home, you might argue uh, with your siblings, with your parents, to vacations even, like you might argue where we're going to go to dinner tonight. Stuff like that, right? So people argue constantly. They might not be, you know, super heated or super uh, intense, but, you know, people argue constantly. Now, a lot of TV channels, like, you know, um, you know, a Democrat versus a Republican debate channel, stuff like that, those are based off of arguments, too. Obviously, those arguments aren't over personal issues, but they're just over, you know, persuading voters to go one way or another during an election, stuff like that. So people argue that uh, it's only when um, people argue that they can see each other's viewpoints, right? The reason we argue is for other people to see both viewpoints or for ourselves to be able to see the person on the other side's viewpoint. And this really helps us, you know, to broaden our perspective and it really helps us, you know, sometimes when we're writing argumentative essays or, or articles um, to have a counter argument to see what the other side's thinking so that we can rebut it. So arguments are good for exchanging viewpoints, but they're kind of bad when they get super heated, right? So we like to keep arguments polite, especially in the literature world when we're, when we're arguing um, two different standpoints. So what are the elements of an argument? Well, you have logical reasoning for or against a main idea, and the key word here being logical reasoning, right? So. An argument has to be about a two-sided topic to be interesting. If an argument is not about a two-sided topic, for example, if I had an argument like, is slavery good? That's obviously not a very good argument because the vast majority of people agree on one side of that. You're not going to find a person that will, be, that, that will be willing to argue on the yes, slavery is good side in public, right? That's not something that um, you would do a good argument on. That, that um, argument would not be, um, it would not be a good argument because first of all, nobody's going to be willing to argue on one of the sides. And second of all, you know, you're not going to persuade anyone, right? You, nobody wants to hear that argument. So it has to be about a two-sided topic. It has to be that not everyone agrees and there's no common consensus or there's not really a common good or bad side, right? Both sides have to be equally, you know, good or bad. You know, they can't, um, either side can't be the dominant side. So it just has to be two standpoints on an issue that aren't necessarily good or bad. They just, you know, not everyone agrees. So the analysis of claims. Now, what are claims? Claims are opinions, okay? Claims are not facts. A lot of times students get this wrong. Um, claims are still opinions. It's when you get to the evidence that you get to the facts, right? The claims are still your, um, your either your opinions or your, you know, uh, what you think supports your claims. So it might be, for example, um, we're, we're, we'll get to an example in a little while, like are Chick-fil-A's heart-shaped chicken mini trays better for Valentine's Day or heart-shaped chocolate boxes? Well, a claim might be, you know, um, the chocolate boxes are not perishable, whereas Chick-fil-A trays are perishable. Now, you might think that's a fact, but that doesn't have any stats or data to support it as of right now, right? Your facts would be this perishes in X days and that perishes in Y days. So um, that is, you know... Um, your facts, whereas, you know, this parish is faster, faster is not a fact, right? So those are examples of claims. Now, a lot of times bad reasoning or faulty evidence leads to an ineffective argument. That's why I underlined logical reasoning here. And 
logical reasoning leads to good claims, whereas good research practices lead to good evidence, right? So a lot of times either bad reasoning or bad claims or faulty evidence or faulty research practices will lead to an ineffective argument on your part. So what are claims? Well, claims can be from the text, Claims can be your own claims, which are going to be the vast majority of uh, argumentative claims, is your own claims. And then claims can also be the claims of the opposing viewpoint. So these are counter arguments, okay? We'll talk about the importance of counter arguments in a little while and why they're so, so important to make your argument more credible. So reliance on evidence. So evidence is very important. Why is evidence important? Well, evidence is super, super important because it is what backs up your claim. Because I can go out into the world and say anything. I can say, um, I don't know, cows are bright red, right? That's, that's not, you know, a fact. So you have to have evidence from a reliable source that has, you know, proven that evidence in order to make your claim credible. So research is a common way to find evidence. But oftentimes you can find evidence to support anything, right? Um, I was in staff's class and the teacher made a joke that said like if you have a set of data even and you can literally make the stat like you know, there you know there's stat analysis software you can literally make them say anything you want like you can take out certain data points and you can you know run certain tests that are favorable to you but the thing about evidence is you have to find evidence that is from a trustworthy source right and trustworthy sources are not going to warp stats, right? They can be trusted to pro uh, give you, you know, the proven and the reliable stats. They're not going to warp the stats. And it's part of that source that makes your, um, your, your reasoning credible. If you have numbers, that doesn't necessarily mean it's credible, right? It's the source that makes it credible. So let's move on. Building an argument. So here's an organizer you might use, right? There's four parts to an argument. There's a main argument or a thesis, and we talked about theses in, um, in, in uh, unit one. And theses are um, mainly written in the same sort of way, but uh, in unit one we talked about you know, the theses of a summary and an analytical writing piece, whereas a, um, an argumentative thesis has a strict you know, one, two, three kind of outline. So you first have your uh, counter argument, and then you have comma, and one, two, three, and usually the counter argument is in a subordinate clause, and then you have one, two, three listed in a list with commas, right? So that's really kind of a strict um, argumentative um, format for a thesis. But in, in a uh, argument, you have many other elements, obviously, and this that's why this um, this um, organizer is so good because you can see um, all of the elements, and all these elements are organized kind of in a good kind of way. So you see reasons and claims, so it's what I just talked about, right? Your one, two, three, not necessarily facts, just claims, stuff that you think you can support with facts. So those are your reasons and claims. Third, you have evidence, obviously, and evidence obviously supports these reasons and claims, which is, of course, the uh, reason evidence is there. And um, a counter argument and rebuttal. Now, how you make a um, argument credible as you tell the reader of the argument, I understand the other side completely. I understand their viewpoint and what they're saying. I understand their points, their evidence, everything. But I don't agree because, right? And after the because comes the rebuttal, right? But the counter argument includes the rebuttal. And the counter argument is especially important because it lets the reader of your argument know, I'm not just arguing one-sidedly. I'm not, it's, the reason I agree with side A is not because I don't know what side B is talking about. The reason I agree with side A is because I've read both sides and I think side A is the better side. Now, and a counter argument really enforces that with your reader, that you know. And it's necessary to enhance your credibility because a non-credible argumentative writer is an argumentative writer that, you know, doesn't, um, doesn't know the other side. It's an argumentative writer that's not, um, not, you know, paying attention to both sides. They're just paying attention to the one side they agree with. So that's the necessity of a counter-argument rebuttal. So you see here, uh, the main idea is basically the thesis, and then you're going to have reasons and then counter arguments right here, right? These are very, very important. 
And these can either be in a separate paragraph, or I think it's suggested you put them um, in one of the body paragraphs. So choose one of the body paragraphs to house your uh, counter argument in. And this is your thesis right here. And obviously I'm writing with a mouse, so this doesn't, it won't look extremely great. But this is the thesis right here, and then you're going to have your three body points right here. And then you're going to have evidence to back up each of the body points, usually maybe two to three pieces of evidence in each of these bubbles right here. And you'll, of course, write these in each of your three body paragraphs. And you're going to write your claim as a first sentence in a body paragraph, and then you're going to have your evidence. So I suggest two to three, yeah. So main arguments and theses. Let's move on and get a bit more specific on what a the argumentative thesis needs to look like. So how you develop an argumentative thesis is you ask yourself, are you for or against the topic? Now, what's the topic? Well, obviously, the topic is going to be something like this. And while this is not a valid thesis, this is um, a topic, right? This is a topic that your teacher might assign you or a topic that, you know, you might want to write an essay about. And you ask yourself, what do I think? So this is my own opinion. What do I think? Am I for or against the topic? Now, if you were to ask me, I'd say the chocolate is better because I love chocolate. But um, there's not really much evidence to the thesis itself, right, in the main argument because and we haven't done research yet. We only told the reader what we as a personal um, writer think. Now, that's where reasons and claims come in, right? So why do I think this? Remember, this is still somewhat opinionated. Why is it not a perfect factual, you know, point, right? Why is just, you know, what I think supports my claim? Now, in reasons and claims, in the thesis statement, you know, you have to put all three reasons and claims in the thesis statement. You don't have to support them with evidence quite yet. So what are the, the logical main reasons? A bad argument comes along, number one, when you don't have a counter argument, but also number two, when your reasons are not logical, when they cannot be supported by valid evidence. So what are the logical main reasons why you are for or are against the topic? So ask yourself, why do I think this? So an example of a reasons or claims question is why do you think heart-shaped chicken mini trays are better? Or why do you think heart-shaped chocolate boxes are better? And you have to outline specific claims, like three or uh, two or three specific claims of why they're better. And then you have evidence. This includes relevant statistics, quotes, anecdotes, stories, and facts. So before we do evidence, I'm sorry, I missed something on this slide. I wanted to go through and see what are certain claims we can have for each of these questions. So first of all, question one, why are CFA heart-shaped chicken mini trays better? Well, you could say they're more popular. You could say they're unique. Not very many people um, have those uh, or, or uh, send those for Valentine's Day. You could say that they're warm, right? You could say they're fresh. Um, you could say you could eat a lot, whereas you can't really eat a whole box of chocolates at a time if you didn't want to get sick. Um, you can eat a lot of chicken minis, right, for lunch. And whereas on the other side, heart-shaped chocolate boxes are better, well, you could have reasons such like such as they're not perishable, right? Chicken minis obviously are perishable. They go bad very quickly. Uh, chocolate is not. Um, you can keep them for a long time, you know, as a keepsake. You don't have to eat them all at once. Who doesn't like chocolate? That's another, that's another op more opinionated claim. But remember, they're always claims, right? And you can support these with evidence. I'll talk about um, evidence to support these claims later on. And uh, you obviously can think of more claims. There's, you know, an infinite amount of claims for each question that you have. But, you know, there's not, you know, there, there's not a fixed, you know, amount of claims that you have to stick to. No, you can think of it with your own claims. As long as you can support them with evidence, they're right. And I always say, <laughs> I always say I like math better than English or reading because... Um, the, uh, in a math, there's, there's a specific answer, whereas in English and reading, like, sometimes the answers vary based on, you know, your own opinion, based on uh, what you like to do, you know, and what you, your opinion is, and um, there's infinite numbers of right answers, and, you know, it gets kind of confusing at times, but, you know, English and reading is probably more effective in real life than math is, so let's go on to the evidence. So this is going to include, notice the word relevant is in all caps. Now, why is the word relevant in all caps? 
Well, you have to get to the idea that if your statistics, quotes, anecdotes, and facts that you put into your essay are not relevant, they are completely without, you know, good, like there's no good it does to your argument. You can say, I have this wonderful source. It's from, you know, the National Government's Institution of Health, right? But if it doesn't have anything to do with their, your claim that you're trying to support, it's not going to do you any good. So this includes, and, and sometimes, before I go further into this, sometimes, you know, evidence that seems like it's relevant isn't relevant. And sometimes evidence that seems like it's not relevant is relevant. So just, you know, keep, keep that in mind. And this can be, of course, statistics, quotes, anecdotes, stories, or facts. And usually, to, uh, usually, we use statistics, quotes, and facts, right? Anecdotes and stories take up a bit more space in an essay, so we don't use them as often. But if you find a really good one to support your story, definitely you can use these as well. So ask yourself, this is the question you ask yourself for number three, how do I know this is the case? And remember, the word know really brings in the concept of facts for us. Like, this is factual. There is nothing opinionated about this. The evidence is all facts, right? So what is evidence for or against the argument that CFA heart-shaped mini chick chicken mini trays are better to give on Valentine's Day than heart-shaped chocolate boxes? So let's look at some of our claims and try to support them. So we said that a claim was that, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A's heart-shaped chicken mini trays are um, more unique than Valentine's Day. Well, you could have a piece of evidence that shows like how many CFA heart trays are given out every Valentine's Day versus like how many, you know, heart-shaped chocolate boxes are given out, you know, and you could show that there's a fewer number, like remember, notice I said number, like actual number of um, mini trays given out than, than uh, heart-shaped chocolate boxes. So if you show that there's a fewer amount then you've supported your claim with factual statistical evidence. So what other evidence is there? Well, maybe like I just said, um, a evidence for heart-shaped chocolate boxes is that they're not perishable, whereas CFA chicken minis are perishable. Well, you could say, well, CFA chicken minis perishes, uh, perish in X number of days and like give the actual number of days. Like I could say five days, for example. I obviously haven't researched this, but I could say five days. Whereas chocolate perishes in, you know, two years or, you know, 600 days or whatever like that, right? So when you're doing this, you need to use academic words or quotes from academic journals or academic websites, stuff like that. So notice I said perishes. I didn't say going bad because going bad could mean a host of things. It could mean food perishing. It could mean, you know, your, your house falling down. It could mean a host of different things, right? Going bad is not specific. Evidence needs to be specific. That's why I said parishes. Scientific words, statistics, numbers, stuff like that. That's evidence. Now, what is a counter-argument and a rebuttal? Well, a counter-argument is an argument that your opponent would make. So think of, as counter think of a counter-argument as one claim from your opponent's side. It doesn't have to be a thesis. Remember, a thesis has a counter-argument and three claims, right? just has to be one claim from your opponent's side. So let's say I was arguing on the CFA heart-shaped chicken mini side. And I said, well, they're great because, you know, they're unique, they're warm, and you can eat a lot of them. Well, a counter-argument might be, well, they're perishable. And then your rebuttal might be, well, I don't care if they're perishable because I'm going to eat them, you know, in a few uh, in a few days at least, right? In a few hours even, right? You could say something like that, or you could rebut it with "There's not as many in a box, so I can eat them faster," you know, stuff like that, right? So a rebuttal is very important as well, but a counter argument is acknowledging an argument that your opponent would make, whereas a rebuttal is responding, not necessarily attacking. Don't, well, that's, there, there's a reason why we don't use the word attacking. We use the word responding because um, you're trying to, um, you're, you're trying not to take down completely or like, you know, hack down your opponent's argument, but you're trying to, you know, prove to your reader why this argument is not, you know, something they should be worried about or not something um, they should be concerned about. So, 
uh, when you respond directly to your opponent's argument, you're showing how or why they're wrong, or you're showing how they're, you know, the places where they're right don't really matter to readers. Stuff like that, right? That's a rebuttal. This is why, what might someone else think, you know? And you don't necessarily know exactly what someone else would think because you're not on that side, but you, you ask yourself, well, if I were on the other side, what might I think? And how can I respond? How can I prove them wrong? Or how can I... Uh, use evidence to, you know, um, to negate their argument, right? So this is extremely important. So how do you show that you know the other side, but that you don't agree? So showing that you know the other side is the counter argument part, whereas where the part you don't agree is the rebuttal part. So how is it effectively that we can show that a, a counter argument um, is valid, but we don't agree, right? How can we show that? Well, a one-sided argument is obviously not as strong as one with a rebuttal. Why is it not as strong? Well, you know, that gives the reader kind of, you know, a suspicion that you might be completely one-sided. You're not, um, you don't know the other side. And because you don't know the other side, you're writing an argument for your side uh, because that's the only side you know. And that's not a good thing to make your reader think because you need completely to make your reader think that you are, um, you, you know the other side, and that you chose your side because of facts and because of evidence, right? So that's the effectiveness of a counter argument and rebuttal. So now we have examples here. We have examples here. Which is a better counter argument and rebuttal? And you might look at the length and you say, well, obviously the longer one's better. Not necessarily. I will go ahead and tell you the longer one is better in this case, but it's not because it's longer or five lines versus three lines that it's better. No, that's not the reason, right? You can have a horrible counter argument and rebuttal that's six pages long and a really nice one that's, you know, half a page. So always read through and look for the characteristics of good counter arguments and rebuttals. And this is, this example is pretty easy. The first one says, um, some may feel, well, the, the uh, counter argument is the same in this case, or in both cases, but the rebuttal is not the same. The counter argument in both cases says some may feel that students should not have the right to wear backpacks during school because it could be a distraction that hinders learning. Same thing that it says in the second one. Whereas the first one's rebuttal says this is not true because students are never distracted at school. What do you notice about the problem with this one? Well, what, what do you notice about, you know, the counter argument? What does the rebuttal do to the counter argument? Well, I'm going to try my best to write this well. What I'm trying to get at here is, is the counter argument is just completely dismissed in this case, right? They're not, um, the, the writer is not rebutting the counter argument with facts and claims. The writer is dismissing the counter argument by just saying students are never distracted at school and any reader that reads that just laughs right i we i, I know you're a student and as am i i am also a student what does it mean they're never distracted at school any reasons any evidence any claims why they're not distracted at school no nothing so this is a really bad rebuttal because of this part right here now let's look at the second one and so i'm not going to read the first sentence because it's the same Second sentence starts, while there may be an adjustment period, if students were allowed to wear backpacks during school, there would actually be fewer distractions because students would not need to go to their lockers during class to get forgotten materials. Because So this one includes a rebuttal that includes a claim or a, I'm sorry, a, a um, uh, you know, a restatement and a claim. So this right here is a claim, right? So what is the difference? Well, it's saying while, this is acknowledging the counter argument, while there may be an adjustment period, if students were allowed to wear backpacks during school, so it's taking down the other person's argument that's saying there would be fewer distractions rather than more distractions because students would not need to go to their lockers during class to get forgotten materials. Hmm. Well, 
one source, uh, well, we don't have to necessarily have, you know, set in stone hard evidence for, for a counter argument, but it's nice to have it. So you might, you know, in Bowling Green High School, we're allowed to wear backpacks every day. And obviously I'm uh, graduated from there already, but uh, in Bowling Green High School, everyone wears backpacks, right? Whereas in Bowling Green Junior High, you have to go to lockers to get stuff. So you might compare the two schools, you know, compare a statistic, how, what's the level of distraction, measure that somehow, you know, that might be a good statistic. So, you know, this one actually addresses the problem, and I'm going to attempt to write again because I'm going to post this uh, written PowerPoint on the website. So addressed. A good counter argument addresses the opponent's side. It does not dismiss the opponent's side as unnecessary or unimportant because in a good, like remember when I said um, a good uh, topic for argument always has two valid sides? Well, if you dismiss the other side as invalid, then you're es essentially dismissing your topic as invalid because, you know, only your side is valid. And that doesn't make a good argument. That doesn't convince anyone. You want to convince people that um, students, you know, should have the right, uh, should, uh, should have the right because of certain one, two, and three, or just one claim, right? What's the reason? People want to know the reason. And people want to know why the opponent is wrong, right? So here are some sentence starters for counter arguments and rebuttals. And what are these sentence starters good for? Well, they're good for, you know, a, a these kind of all surround a concept of understanding the other side and politely disagreeing. Because we're writing scholarly essays, right? We're writing articles that are um, that are designed to have two sides that aren't right and wrong, two sides that are just, you know, maybe in the gray area or two sides that different groups of people agree with. So it's all of these sentence starters surround understanding the other side and politely disagree, right? You need to politely disagree to give yourself more credibility. So uh, examples are while supporters of you know, CFA Chicken Mini Hearts might say they are, um, I, I don't know, what was one claim we had, uh, might say they are unique, they overlook the fact that they go bad very quickly. You know, that's a, that's not a complete counter-argument and rebuttal, but that's just a gist of it. So, um, although some might argue that chocolate hearts are better, CFA hearts are better because they're unique. You know, stuff like that. Um, you could say CFA hearts going bad is an understandable concern. And this is more on the negative side. Um, so you're disproving that your own argument is negative, okay? So this is more on the negative side of things. Uh, while CFA hearts are, uh, might go bad very quickly is an understandable concern, but, but why? So you have a rebuttal there, but you know, they're, they're unique and we eat them up very quickly. Stuff like that, right? So there's a couple more in spite of the fact that blank, comma, blank. A common argument against this position is blank, but blank. So you get the idea. You don't have to use these exactly. Remember when I just said, um, you know, like, although some might argue CFA hearts go bad, so we could put this here, while CFA hearts go bad. We don't, you don't have to, you know, use exactly these words. But these words are more polite, more formal, and they're good sentence starters for uh, you all that are just starting to write argumentative essays. So here's a few topics. And I'm not going to go through each of these for the sake of time, but, um, you might think about each of these topics yourself, and you can write, you know, a main argument, thesis, reason, claim, reason, claim, reason, claim. So these, each of these three are body paragraphs, right? I'm going to attempt to write this okay. Sorry, my writing is not good on the screen, but when you're trying to write with the mouse, it's bad. So body paragraphs are each of these. So you have three reasons and claim or claims. And the, remember, these are still kind of opinionated. These are just your own claims, what you think is true. And you support what you think is true with evidence, evidence and evidence, right? Remember when I said counter arguments and rebuttals can either end up inside one reason and claim or they can be a separate paragraph. But I think the suggestion is that you put them inside one reason and claim. So 
One example of this is while blank, comma, smartphones um, are harmful to people because. So I might say, while smartphones enhance the communication technology of the modern world, comma, smartphones are harmful to people because they allow blue light to enter our eyes every day. You know, that's a good, um, that, that's a good, um, you know, counter argument for that one. But what, um, well, that's a good thesis, I'm sorry, for that one. And then after that, you would put because smartphones are harmful to people because they, uh, blue light enters every day because what else? And then you put two more claims for that. So you have three. So I, I um, wrote down in my notes that you have the formula while blank. So that's kind of your counter claim, comma. Smartphones are harmful to people because one, so your, your first claim, comma, two, your second claim, comma, three, your third claim, period. And that's your thesis. That's a um, typical and that's a really good standard um, uh, um, argumentative thesis, right? So that ends up at the end of your first introduction paragraph. At least that's my habit. It can end up in the middle and the beginning of your first paragraph, but I usually put it at the end of the first paragraph. So your readers get a sense of, you know, the roadmap of your essay before they start reading the first body paragraph and they start getting deeper, you know. So that's my suggestion. And then you have the three body paragraphs and then you have a conclusion, right? And your conclusion, you've heard a lot that your conclusion restates your thesis exactly. That is not true. Um, your, your conclusion should provide some more insight, not any new evidence or new claims, but some more insight maybe on your previous claims and then end it out with, you know, a sort of restatement of your thesis, but also, you know, uh, maybe something else for your readers to think about. Let's keep going. This is one of them. We have another example here. Students should not be given homework. Well, I as a person do not agree with this because without homework you don't learn. But um, you, you could have, you know, use the same formula. And I'm not going to go through this exactly with you all, but you can use the same formula. I'm going to give you one example maybe in a little while. But, you know, use the same formula to, you know, write a thesis and then your three claims and then a conclusion, right? So let me give you an example of a good, um, a good thesis. So you might say, while homework takes a long time every day and prevents students from doing a lot of extracurriculars, so that's your counterclaim, right? While homework prevents students from doing extracurriculars, that's your counterclaim, comma, students should be given homework because, and this is on the positive side, obviously, because, number one, homework and practice help students solidify what they learned, Number two, homework helps students train their work ethic while nobody's looking over their shoulder. And number three, you know, student uh, homework trains students for college where they'll have to do their own work and teachers will not be uh, monitoring them every day. So that, that could be a good thesis statement. And, you know, that has three body points as well as a counterclaim at the beginning. So that's a typical thesis statement. So finally, uh, obviously, I can't make you do an exit slip because you know I'm, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the computer. But I want you all to think about this. What is one thing we covered today that can apply to your writing to make your argumentative writing better? Because I'm sure that you've written, you know, argumentative piece before, whether it be a full five paragraph essay or whether it be just be a short answer, probably on K Prep or in some of your uh, previous English classes. But what is something we covered today that can apply to your argumentative writing to make it better? So think about what we covered today, you know, how to write a counter argument, what's a good counter argument and rebuttal, maybe like um, what's a good evidence, you know, and the sources of evidence, you know, the claims and how they're just opinions, they're not necessarily facts just yet. Stuff that we covered today, how does that uh, apply to your writing to make your argument of writing better? So that's all I have for an introduction to argument. We'll be doing some practice and some more um, some more content in um, sections 5.2 and 5.3. And I hope you continue to join us, continue tuning in. Again, I'm Samuel Chang for Joiner English, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Keep safe and healthy. Thank you.